Good morning, members, committee members, specially invited guests of the PSCU. I'm your moderator, Anika Aliong, along with Mrs. Arlene Popwell Stephen, and we'd like to welcome you to PSU's Home Healthcare Webinar. I'd like to share some house rules before we begin today. So today's Home Healthcare Webinar will be delivered in sections. Please allow our facilitator to present each section. At the end of each section, there will be a Q&A session. Please place your questions via the Q&A icon, which is located to the bottom of your screen. When you have a question, feel free to click on the icon and type in the question, and we will answer the questions during the segments. And of course, as always, we thank you for your courtesy and respect when asking these questions. So I would like to now introduce today's facilitator, Mrs. Beverly Byam Hercules. She served as a registered nurse for over 30 years and received her formal training in nursing at San Fernando General Hospital. She migrated to the US and worked as a staff nurse in the operating room at Howard University Hospital for several years. She attended Howard University as well and graduated with a Bachelor of Science in nursing degree and received a graduate certificate in health, in health services administration from Central Michigan University. Mrs. Byam Hercules has served as an assistant director of nursing in ambulatory surgery at Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York, also as a clinical director of nursing at the George Washington Surgery Center in Washington, DC and as a clinical nurse manager at Howard University Uni Hospital in Washington, DC. She has since retired from nursing and is a member of Toastmasters International, a volunteer organization that provides an educational program in communication and leadership training. Please help me welcome Mrs. Beverly Byam Hercules with her presentation today on high blood pressure, stroke, heart failure, and how COVID-19 affects the body. Thank you and good morning, Ms. Anika, and to everyone out there. I have, a, I have a question for all of you. How many of you have or know someone who has had high blood pressure or have had a stroke or suffers from heart failure or even COVID-19? I'm pretty sure many of you know someone like that, or it might be you yourself. The circulatory system of the human body is very important in, giving, in sustaining life and the health of the human body. There are some disorders of this circulatory system that may put you at risk. Today, we will look at hypertension or high blood pressure, hypertension, stroke, heart failure, and touch on the effects of the COVID-19 virus on the system. During this presentation, I may be using some technical terms, but I will explain what they mean. And some of the slides may be a little graphic for some people. So if, if you don't like what you see, just look away a little bit. So the circulatory system, that's the one that carries all of the, the blood to the different parts of the body. It's a closed system. It consists of a lot of tubes and vessels, and it carries the blood that the body needs. It transports blood, red and white blood cells, plasma, and platelets. The red blood cells, they, carry, they transport oxygen, the life-giving oxygen to all parts of the body. The white blood cells, they fight the infection. Platelets help the body to clot, helps the blood to clot. And the plasma is the liquid part of the blood and it transports all of the nutrients like electrolytes and glucose to the cells of the body. Those same red blood cells that carry oxygen, when the oxygen is used up, they, take the, they, they, they go back to the lungs so that the oxygen can be replenished in those cells. So the cardiovascular system, which involves the heart and lungs, they play a huge part in the, in the process of the replenishing of the oxygen in the blood. And there are serious consequences if the cardiovascular system malfunctions. 
So we're going to move on to the high blood pressure. But what is blood pressure? Blood pressure is the force of the pressure of the blood pressing against the insides of the arteries when the heart beats and when the heart relaxes. You, and just think about it, some pressure that's going on all the time. If it's elastic, eventually the elastic gives out or it might just burst open. So the readings for blood pressures are recorded in two numbers, like 120 over 80, one number above the other and is measured in millimeters of mercury. What do, those, what do the two numbers mean? The 120 or the higher number is called a systolic pressure and it is the pressure in the arteries when the heart beats to pump that blood throughout the entire body. The diastolic pressure is the pressure in the arteries when the heart rests. So if that is high, the, heart, the, the, the vessels aren't really resting much, are they? So there are two types of hypertension. There's primary hypertension. And this one has no clearly identifiable cause. It creeps up over the years. And it's referred to as the silent killer because you never know that you have it un unless until all of the damage has already been done. So it's associated with genetics. Mostly black people have high blood pressure or they're susceptible to high blood pressure. Your diet that's high in sodium and fat can contribute to it as well as obesity. That means you're overweight. The secondary hypertension, it has an identifiable cause. It occurs as a sudden more severe and it's more severe than, than primary hypertension. It often accompanies kidney disease and is a side effect of medications such as corticosteroids, antidiuretics, and oral contraceptives, which tend to cause the body to retain water. This in turn raises the blood volume. So now high blood pressure affects several areas in the, in the body. It affects the heart by causing damage to the arteries that can become blocked and prevent blood flow to the heart. It can cause a stroke, causing the blood vessels in the brain to be damaged and become blocked or even burst. It can cause kidney damage or kidney disease or kidney failure by damaging the arteries around the kidney and, interfere that in, and it interferes with the kidney's ability to filter urine or blood effectively. It can cause vision loss due to damage to the blood vessels in the eyes. And it can cause sexual dysfunction in men. It can lead to erectile dysfunction and it can lower libido in women. Angina, that chest pain that you hear people talking about, can result over, the, over time with high blood pressure. And it can lead to heart disease or microvascular disease and angina or chest pain is a common symptom. Hypertension can also cause peripheral artery disease. And a lot of times you see diabetics suffering with this. A narrowing of the arteries in the legs, the arms, the stomach, and head, and it can cause fatigue and pain. So what are the causes and risk factors for high blood pressure? Kidney disease is a potential cause of the increased blood pressure. The kidneys help to excrete water out of the body by using the sodium iron. That sodium that the doctor always tells you about to cut down on the amount of salt. So if the kidneys are sick, they don't excrete enough sodium and water, and this causes the fluid to remain in the blood vessels. And this increases the blood pressure. And that is similar to taking, sticking your finger inside an open hose to prevent the outflow of water, and this will raise the pressure with inside, inside the hose. So it does the same thing to our blood vessels. Problems with the arteries in the body. If you notice here, this is a normal artery. It's nice and clean and clear. This one is one that has plaque on it. So the, the, the lumen is narrow. The, the area where the blood can flow through is narrow. So it's called stenosis or narrowing of an important artery occurs and the blood begins to back up in the arterial circulation leading to hypertension or high blood pressure. So the water is just backing up. The blood is just backing up and causing the, the vessels to to have a lot of pressure inside of them. 
cancer can also lead to high blood pressure. And one, one notable cancer is one called a pheochromocytoma. And all it means is that there's a, a tumor on the top of the gland that sits on top of the kidney, the adrenal gland, and this tumor produces a hormone that causes the, the blood vessels to constrict and raise the blood pressure. For example, if you took an inflated balloon and you pressed it together, the pressure would build up before and after the area where it's constricted. It might even pop. The blood vessel might even pop. So this hormone and from this tumor signals the blood vessels to squeeze down on themselves and raise the pressure within them. Other things that can cause hypertension are something called hypoaldosteronism. And all it means is that another, another gland in the kidney, that adrenal gland is producing too much of its hormone and it leads the kidney to increase water retention. It makes the kidney feel that the body is going, in, going into dehydration so it holds back the water. And then you have hypothyroidism. You see people with those goiters when the thyroid gland produces too much of the hormone and it stimulates the heart to beat faster and increase the amount of, of blood that's coming into the circulation. So then you have, so those are some of the things that can cause hypertension apart from just being just aging and your blood vessels just having that tension all the time. So chronic hypertension causes direct damage, direct damage to scarring of and weakening of blood vessels with subsequent further repercussions in each specific location and organ system thereafter. So we just saw all the different organs that hypertension can affect. What I wanna pull up here now is a chart that shows you a range of hypertension. So normal is less than 120 over 80. It's elevated when you go from 120 to 129 over less than 80. Then you go to hypertension or high blood pressure stage one. When your blood pressure is 130 to 139, over 80 to 89, you are in stage one hypertension. Then we get into the critical stages, stage two hypertension, where your blood pressure goes 140 or, to, or higher, over 90 or higher. And then, you know, these are the ranges they start to call, we sometimes refer to a stroke range. When you go to 180 or higher, over 120 or higher. So these, so you need to, you can download a chart like this and keep it for your reference to make sure that you keep in track of your blood pressure and you're not creeping up into that stage because this is when it becomes really the silent killer because some people are walking around with these blood pressures and they just don't know. There are no specific signs and symptoms for high blood pressure. The only way to know is to have your blood pressure taken. There's no cure for high blood pressure, but it can be managed. In a rare case, a person may develop a sudden onset of high blood pressure, and they may have things like nosebleed, headaches, neurological symptoms like confusion and blurred vision. And these symptoms indicate that something is really wrong and your blood pressure is dangerously high. So some of the things that we need to do to take care of our blood pressure, we need to make sure that we exercise. We need to quit smoking if you're a smoker, because it doesn't only affect you, it affects the people around you. You need to take care of the, or, or lessen the amount of alcohol that you take in and lessen the amount of salt. You need to, it, to maintain your body weight and keep a body mass index that is close to what is, is normal for your height and weight. Have a different diet, a more healthy diet with more fruits, vegetables, and whole grain. And the other thing is you need to have your blood pressure checked regularly, especially as you begin to go up in age, you want to make sure that you have your blood pressure checked. Then you want to keep 
maybe download a chart that tells you what is a normal height and weight for your a normal weight for your height and make sure that you're not underweight or you're not overweight or obese. So at this time, I'll entertain some questions. Thank you so much, Mrs. Bayam Hercules. I saw that Ms. Andrews raised her hand. So I'm going to ask all of our participants, if you have questions, please go to the Q&A icon, which is located at the bottom and type in your questions so we can answer. So just to recap, remember that the blood pressure is that is, is the pressure that is inside of the arteries pressing against the wall of the arteries when the heart pumps blood and when it relaxes. Again, for those of you that have raised your hands, please go to the Q&A and type in your questions so we can answer them. Okay, I'll move on to the other section and we can come back to some of those questions in the interest of time. Strokes, what is a stroke? A stroke is a medical condition that occurs when blood flow to the brain tissue decreases or stops. This lack of oxygen may cause permanent brain damage and the brain can be damaged if it goes for five minutes or more without that life-giving oxygen. So that we understand what happens with a stroke, I'll just go to the circulation, the blood circulation to the brain. And we're looking at this from underneath. If you're looking at the brain from underneath, like from like the next section, this circle here is called the circle of Willis and several blood vessels come together to form that. And it, what it does, it, it routes blood differently to different parts of the brain, sometimes in the, in the event that there is a blockage or something to that effect or some damage to the brain. So the blood vessels, the brain gets its blood from what is called the internal carotid arteries. And the internal carotid artery is right here. You can see it right here, the internal carotid artery. That comes up from the, the common carotid artery that comes off of the aorta. And then also the vertebral arteries come up and they all loop together to form the circle of Willis. The most common areas for getting a stroke is the common carotid artery and the middle, middle vertebral arteries, the middle cerebral, sorry, the middle cerebral arteries. So in the middle of the brain, those are the most common areas for getting a stroke. So what are the causes and types of strokes? We have an ischemic stroke, and that is when you have a clot or a piece of tissue like the plaque from the artery walls come up and block the blood vessels. And it causes some death to the brain area. 87% of strokes are ischemic strokes. The next type of strokes we have are hemorrhagic strokes. That means that there's bleeding in the brain or there's bleeding out around the brain. 13% of these strokes are hemorrhagic. And that is something that probably runs in my family because my grandmother died from one, my mother died from one. So these, these bleeds are intracerebral. Sometimes they're inside the brain or they can be subarachnoid, which is lining on the outside of the brain. So this is the brain has a lining over it. And this is one of them. So you have here an aneurysm, which is like a swelling or a weakening in the wall of the vessel and it bursts. And here you see the blood. This particular one is on the lining of the brain. The most common cause of a hemorrhagic stroke is uncontrolled high blood pressure. Some of the things that cause hemorrhagic strokes are called um, true artero arterial venous malformation. Some of them where the arteries and the veins join in areas where they should not have. This here is an example of one. Then there's something called a cavernous malformation. This is just a 
jumbled mess of stuff, blood vessels that just there. Depending on what effects they have, the, the, the neurosurgeon may go in and remove them. Then you have regular venous malformations and then a hemangioma. And hemangioma can form on the, it's like a birthmark. You see people with those birthmarks. And then it would go on. It can, it can form on the liver, the heart, the brains. It can form anywhere in the body. But it can cause a problem if it's, it's on the brain. And then you have something called a dura fistula, which is a, the, the, in the brain, there's something called the venous sinuses, and these return blood to the heart for reoxygenation. If you notice in this picture here, this is all blue, meaning that it's veins. And then in this picture here comes this artery to hijack it and try to join up with it. So this can cause a problem as well and prevent the blood from returning to the heart and cause a problem in the brain. Now with hemorrhagic strokes, one of the things that you have to understand, the brain is in a box. It's a hard box. You put pressure inside it, there's nowhere for the brain to go. It, it, it starts pressing up against it and that can, that can also cause brain damage. So, they're, they're, so those are some of the types of strokes. There are other types of strokes, like the transient ischemic attack. They might tell you that they have a TIA or a mini stroke. This thing here, this transient ischemic attack, you need to pay attention to that because if you have that, it is just a warning sign telling you that the big stroke is coming. Then there is the cryptogenic stroke. Most times the doctors can determine what caused the stroke, but there are times when they can't. And so that so then that's, it is described as a cryptogenic stroke because they have no idea what really caused the stroke to occur. And then you have the brainstem stroke. But the brainstem stroke, if that occurs at the bottom of the brain, it can leave the person in what is called a locked state. They, they are paralyzed from the, from the neck down. So you want to be careful with strokes and you need to know the signs and symptoms of strokes. There's an acronym that teaches you the signs and symptoms of strokes and generally it's called FAST. Because when you don't get a stroke in time or it's not treated properly on time, it results in a lot of disability. So FAST is face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulties, and time to call. And time to call means that you need to call for the emergency medical persons call the ambulance or what, whoever it is you need to call in the United States is 911 in Trinidad I think is 999 or call for the ambulance if you know the numbers so some that those are some of the the signs and symptoms of stroke but here are the others or a, a more comprehensive list slurred speech the person is trying to talk to you one side of the face droops down Weakness on one side of the body in the arms or the legs. So you tell them to hold their arms out if the hand, arm keep dropping down or you tell them to lift their leg up and the leg, they can't raise it or the leg is just drooping down, that's a sign. Dizziness or abnormal balance. Severe headaches with possible associated nausea or vomiting. Aphasia or inability to speak or find the words. They might be telling you something that makes absolutely no sense to you, but it makes sense to them. And change or loss of vision in one or both eyes. Some other signs and symptoms are numbness and weakness. And again, confusion, trouble seeing, trouble walking. Like I remember with my mom, when she was walking, one leg was just kicking out to the side. She had no control over it. And then there are severe headaches. This is another acronym that I like better because it says be fast. So we talk about balance, loss of balance and headache or dizziness. And they talk about the eyes again, the face on one side of the face is drooping, then the arms or the leg weakness, then speech difficulties, they might not be able to speak. And then again, time to call for emergency medical care. So there are some causes and risk factors that are for strokes. Some of them we can control and others we cannot. So some of the controllable ones are obesity. Watch your weight. You know, some people like some people like to say, oh, she's nice and fat and she thick or whatever it is, or oh, he's nice and, you know, he's fit. Be careful. Make sure that your weight is within range. High blood pressure is another one. Elevated cholesterol. Look at your diet. You want to cut down on red meats and, and oils and fats and things like that. Diabetes is another 
major um, controllable risk factor. Then tobacco use, you want to cut down on tobacco use or stop altogether. Illicit drug use like cocaine or methamphetamines, these things raise the blood pressure and can cause the stroke. Medications such as birth control or estrogen causing, they cause clots and abnormal heart rhythms such as atrial fibrillation because with atrial fibrillation, the blood, the, the blood is just, the, 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 the bores of the heart are just doing like this and not really pumping. And so that blood staying there can cause clot formation. There are some uncontrollable risk factors. Family history of vascular disease. So somebody like me, I have to be very careful and keep up with my healthcare regime. Aneurysms or defects of the blood vessels. That means the wall of the vessel is, is weakened and it can form a bubble and burst. Or if you have trauma or a car accident or fall, that can lead to a stroke. Your race, again, African-Americans or black people are more susceptible to strokes. Gender. If you are a male, you are more likely to have a stroke. So men, pay attention. Women, if you get a stroke, you are more likely to die. So again, the prevention of stroke, we go back again. 80% of strokes can be prevented. Control the blood pressure. You know, some people like to take the blood pressure medication when they feel the blood pressure high. Take the blood pressure medication all the time because then that maintains a level of, of, of the drug in your body so that it can control the blood pressure. Even if you get angry or something happens, you want to make sure that the blood pressure is under control. Again, a healthy diet, fruits, vegetables, whole grain, leave out the red meat. Engage in regular physical activity. That means at least 20 to 30 minutes a, a day, maybe three times a week at the minimum. No smoking. Quit the smoking. Maintain a healthy weight and take your medications as prescribed. There are three do's and don'ts that you want to pay attention to when you recognize that someone has a stroke because by now you know what the person is doing. You know, you, you can recognize the stroke. So do call for emergency medical care immediately. Note the time that you first see the symptoms because the doctors might be asking you questions like when, when did it start? What happened? Were they numb? Was there numbness? Were there weakness? Or, you know, they might be asking you questions. And if you're not paying attention, then you probably not help much help to the person who's having the stroke. And give CPR if necessary. If that person stops breathing or you're not feeling a pulse or anything like that, you probably want to start CPR. Do not let the person go to sleep or talk you out of calling for the ambulance or for emergency help. Do not give them medication, food, or drink. Yeah, you hear people say, yes, give them some aspirin. You don't know if it's a hemorrhagic stroke or bleeding, then the aspirin is going to stop the blood from being able to clot and it's going to be flowing more freely. With food or drink, they may want to rush them to surgery to do what they call a burr hole to relieve the pressure in the brain. So you don't want to give them food or drink or medication. And do not drag yourself or someone to the emergency room. One of the things that is why they say this is because if you have the ambulance there, those people can actually start treating the stroke before the patient even gets to the, to the hospital. So again, take care of yourself. Make sure you follow those rules of controlling that blood pressure, eating properly, exercising, quitting smoking, quitting alcohol, and things like that. And at this point, I will stop again and ask if there are any questions. Yes, we have some questions, Mrs. Bayam Hercules. A member asked, when is the best time to measure your blood pressure? Usually in the morning when you get up, you should take your blood pressure so you know what it is. And perhaps you want to do it again in the night. And if you're having an issue, you maybe want to do it maybe about three times a day to see where the pressure is. And then you keep a log of it. You want to keep a, a log of the systolic blood pressure, the diastolic pressure, and your pulse rate. Because sometimes, sometimes, like there's something called a, a 
a widening pulse pressure, the difference between the diastolic and the systolic. If it's too wide, it might denote that the person is probably suffering from dehydration or other medical conditions. So you want to keep a log of that. And when you go to the doctor, you want to make sure you walk with that log of the blood pressure. The, you, I would write down the date and the time, and I would write a little comment on to see, you know, what was happening that particular day. Maybe I might have had some stressful day at work or something like that. So you want to, you want to do that so that your doctor can get a better picture of what's going on with you and the blood pressure. Another member asks, what can cause a pressure to suddenly go up and come down with no medicine intake? Sometimes, sometimes stress causes the blood pressure to go, to go up high. So the other thing that you might want to, to um, work on is maybe if your blood pressure is going up higher that way, you would probably want to try doing some meditation exercises, some deep breathing to control the, the pressure. So it could be stress or it could be something else, some other, some other underlying condition that you don't know about. So you may want to check your doctor again and follow up to see if anything else is going on with another part of the body. It might be the kidneys that is uh, given a signal that they, they're trying to fail or something is going on there as well. Another participant asks, what causes a lack of oxygen and does drinking water help? What causes a lack of oxygen is usually something to do with the red blood cells. Sometimes your blood, your blood platelet, your blood cell count might, your red blood cell count might be low. You might be anemic. You might have problems going on in your lungs, so that the blood, the blood is not getting the oxygen that it requires from being in the from from the lungs. And we'll go through some of that in the next segment. One last question: What is the best pulse rate? 72 is usually what is called a normal. But if you are very athletic, you may be running with a pulse rate of about 55, 50 to 55. But if you are ill and you have that sort of pulse rate, it's called bradycardia. It might be, it might, there might be a problem with your heart and the, the electrical conduction system within the heart. Okay. Now this, um, another participant asked, could a medication take your blood pressure, carry your blood pressure too low? Yes, it can. That's why you want to keep monitoring the blood pressure even though you're taking the, the medication. Because it might be that the dosage might be a bit too high. Maybe because you started doing your exercises, you're looking at your diet and you're doing all these different things. Medic the, the dosage that you were getting before, because you weren't doing those things, needed to control the blood pressure and now it's being controlled. So you want to go back to your doctor again and have him to measure the, to, to adjust your medication dosage. So that's why it's good to keep a log. Then you know for yourself, oh, my blood pressure is rising. What's going on in my life? It might be that there's something wrong with somebody might be ill. You, you, your child might be giving you problems or you, you have a stressful situation going on at work. So you want to look at those things as well. That's why those little comments next to your daily blood pressure me measurements would help. Any more questions? I hope that answers that question. Ms. Stevens? Like, yes, I would like to say something as well, or actually ask a question. Sometimes when you go to the pharmacy to get over-the-counter medication, probably for a common cold or something like that, the pharmacist will ask you or should ask you whether you suffer with hypertension or high blood pressure. What is the relevance of that when, you know, most people will take a Panadol or some kind of tablet like that for the common cold. What, why, why is it important to know if you actually suffer from high blood pressure when you're taking these over-the-counter medications? Because some of those medications actually increase blood pressure. You know, like some of them, they would constrict blood vessels to prevent all, you know, like runny nose and cough and things like that. So all of, so those medications are contraindicated if you have high blood pressure. So you may, you may want to consult your doctor and have them to prescribe something else that does not raise the blood pressure.
any other questions before we move on? I'm not seeing any questions so far. Okay, so now we move on to heart failure. The heart is a pump. Its only job is to pump blood. So the heart failure occurs when the heart is unable to pump blood adequately enough to meet the energy demands of the body, tissues, and organs. That's all the heart does. It pumps blood. And this is how the... the, the so in order for the heart to do its job, the pump requires to, to, to pump the blood. It requires an efficient pumping rhythm, a good valve system, and a good functioning muscle. Any abnormalities or sufficient severity of any of these components of the heart can affect the pumping efficiency and cause the heart to fail. So now what we will do is look at the structure of the heart. The heart has four chambers, the right atrium and the left atrium. These are smaller chambers. They are collecting chambers. They collect the blood from the, the veins that bring the blood into them. Then you have the pumping chambers which are the right and the left ventricles. They push blood out of the heart. It also has myocardial tissue. And this is a special type of tissue. It's an electrical tissue and myocardial tissue is specialized tissue comprised of involuntary muscle. That means we cannot control it. And it is the only muscle and the only org organ in the body that works from the time we are born to the time that we die, our heart is pumping. It also contains something called an electrical conduction system, and this acts as a battery giving juice to the heart so that it can create contractions. It consists of the sinoatrial node and the bundle of his and the Purkin G fibers. These control the rhythm in which the heart beats. You know, we Trinidadians, you know, we like a little rhythm going. So the heart has a rhythm to do, to do, to do, to do. Any malfunctions in the electrical conduction system results in irregular heartbeats. So look at, let us look at the blood flow through the heart. So the, the blood comes through from the superior vena cava, collects blood from the, the head area. The inferior vena cava collects blood from the rest of the body and it, it brings back this deoxygenated or blood depleted of oxygen into the right atrium. From here, it goes through the tricuspid valve or the atrioventricular valve called the tricuspid valve because it has three flaps. It goes into the right ventricle. The right ventricle pushes the blood into the pulmonary artery. It goes through the through the pulmonary valves into the pulmonary artery. From the head, it goes into the right and left lung. So the lung is somewhere around it. It goes into the left to the right and left lung. It gets, uh, the air exchange takes place in the little tiny sacs in the lung filled with air. The carbon dioxide goes out into the, the cells and the oxygen comes back into the red blood cells. Then the blood brings, it brings it back from the lungs. It comes back into the left ventricle through the pulmonary veins, the left and right pulmonary veins, through the bicuspid valves or the mitral valves into the left into the left ventricle and then the left ventricle pushes it throughout the aortic valves into the aorta and from here this is called the ascending aorta this is the arch of the aorta and then the descending aorta going to the bottom of the through the, the chest and the abdomen and all to the and then it branches off to the various arteries these here go up to the brain and to the the neck and shoulders any problem with these valves here these valves become stiff the blood, cannot, the, the blood cannot go through. It has to increase the pressure to go through the, the, the blood vessels. If the valves are too weak, then you have regurgitation. So the blood is backflowing and there's a backflow going on. Then we have the electrical conduction system. Here we have the sinoatrial node. These are specialized electrical fibers that go through the left and right atria. So this is in the right atrium. So this is where the rhythm comes on. Then we have the atrioventricular atrio ventricular node because it's between the atrium and the ventricle. Then we have the bundle of His. 
And sometimes you hear the doctor might say you have right bundle branch block or you have left bundle branch block and they are skipping a beat and all this sort of thing. It's because this system is malfunctioning. And then it goes on to the Perkin G fibers that go into the ventricles that gives them the, type, the, the, the rhythm to squeeze the blood. Another thing I want to point out to you in here is these are the right and left coronary arteries. They come, once the aorta leaves the heart, the first branches are the right and left coronary arteries. So you want to pay attention to those. So we have some different types of heart failure. And there are some causes and risk factors to heart failure. There's a left-sided heart failure and a right-sided heart failure. Some of the things that, that can cause heart failure is coron the coronary arteries, how they narrow and they, there's a problem with the blood flow to them. They come out and they go around the heart and they provide the heart actually with, with um, blood. Then there's the atrial, the arrhythmias, abnormal heart rhythm. So you might have some that have come that are soon, some that are missing, some that slows the heart, some that speed up the heart. Heart valve problems, like I showed you before. And the, the heart doesn't have enough problem, have enough um, strength to pump the blood. If you have had a previous heart attack, you would have that would be one one of the areas where the, the heart is not pumping. So the rest of the heart has to work a little bit harder to get blood out. Some congenital heart conditions where you have you ever heard the children have a hole in the heart. So the blood is going from one ventricle to the other, mixing up and not doing what it's supposed to do. And again, the heart muscle is becoming thick or enlarged. So here, here, just a picture of the coronary arteries. They just go around the heart in the back of thorns. So we have left heart side types of heart failures. There's left-sided heart failure and then there's right-sided heart failure. So in left-sided heart failure, the heart pumps oxygen, rich blood, which comes from the lung through the left atrium. And I'll just go back a couple slides to, to, to show you that. So the blood comes from the, from the lungs through the left atri to the left atrium and the left ventricle contains most of the pumping power and it must work harder to pump the same amount of blood. This can happen if the aorta valves, they use these here going to the aorta, or the walls of the aorta are stenosed or narrow. Then, it, and if there's too much pressure in the vessels because of high blood pressure, the, blood, the, the ventricle has to push really hard to get this blood out of the aorta. If you have all of these things, then the, the, the blood backs up inside the lung. It, goes, it, it doesn't have anywhere to go. It can't, it can't go. So it backs up inside of the lung and then you have pul and causes what is called pulmonary edema and pulmonary hypertension. On the other hand, if you have right-sided heart failure, because, because the blood is pushing in, in from, um, blood into the lungs, the blood is coming back from the body and it can't push the blood through these pulmonary arteries to go into the lungs. So if the left side fails, then the right side will fail eventually. So what are the signs and symptoms of heart failure, left-sided heart failure? You have pulmonary edema. The lungs are getting filled with fluid and it, there's no way for it to go. So it, sometimes it trickles into the little air sacs that's supposed to be filled with air. You have problems breathing. You have dyspnea, which is shallow, rapid breathing. Then you have orthopnea, which is an inability to lie flat because you have problems breathing. You have something called paroxysmal nocturnal dys dyspnea. You fly up in the night because you can't breathe. You have lung crackles. When they listen to your lungs, it, it sounds like little crackles in the lungs. Then you have wheezing, a continuous high-pitched song. <laughs> When you're listening through the stethoscope, that's some, some of the things that you would hear. Then you have an irritating cough, or you have chain strokes, respirations, which are an abnormal, abnormal pattern of breathing, characterized by progressively deeper and sometimes faster breathing, followed by a gradual um, decrease that results in the person's temporarily stopped breathing. And then you have pulse, you have a strong pulse beat and a, a, a shallow one, a strong and a shallow, a strong and a shallow, a strong and a shallow pulse beat. 
and then you have decreased cardiac output because the, the, the heart cannot continue to push against all of that pressure. Then you have heart murmurs, then weight gain. And then you would see that person, be, they would probably have like bluish lips and bluish fingers and toes. And I just want you to pay attention here with the pulmonary edema, because in a regular lung, these are the tiny alveolar sacs that where the air exchange takes place. When you have, pul when you have pulmonary edema, these sacs get filled with water or, or fluid and or blood and the, the air exchange cannot take place the way it should. When you have right-sided heart failure now, you have decreased breath sounds because again, you can't, you can't breathe properly because the, the lung is filled with fluid. And then you have overinflation of the chest wall. You find the person starting to get what they call a barrel chest because they, they're fighting so hard to, to breathe. Low mobile diaphragm, the diaphragm is tired of working. It gets hard, it gets stiff, it can't move the way it's supposed to. Then you have jugular vein distension. You ever see people with that vein that swell up in the neck here? That is an indication of right-sided heart failure. Then you have low cardiac output. The, the ventricles cannot pump the amount of blood they need for the body. You have, again, dysrhythmias. as like a sinus, what they call a tachycardia. Tachycardia means that the, the heart is beating faster than 72 months, um, or actually over 90 beats a minute. And that's because it's trying to tell the, 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 the heart, pump some more blood, pump some more blood because we, we can't breathe. The cells are telling the heart that. And then you have, again, edema and gain. And this can be in the legs or if you're standing up or it can be in the sacrum area or the, the back if you're laying down. And then it can be, start to affect the liver and you end up with, with jaundice as well. So again, the lifestyle changes are the same. Here, here is an example of somebody with what is called pitten edema. That means that when you press down that, that, that um, your thumb in the person's leg, it leaves a, a sink like that. So again, the lifestyle changes, the same of all the previously discussed um, conditions. Control the blood pressure, healthy diet, low sodium, more fruits, veggies, and whole grains, and lower alcohol consumption and stop smoking. Because once you get into heart failure, the, pro the prognosis for heart failure is very dismal. It's downhill from then on. But you can, if you control all of those other factors, live a really healthy life uh, and active life. So again, I'll ask any questions and then I'll move over. We just have probably about 15 minutes and I shouldn't be able to cover, cover the COVID from here. Okay, a member has asked, or oh, sorry, a participant has asked, what would cause pulse of a person who is not athletic to be 55 or less? They have a problem with the conduction system in the heart, the one that creates the rhythm. They probably have a block in, in one of those areas or one of those nodes is not working properly. So the, so the, so the electrical conduction system in the heart is not working right. They may want to have, they may want to go to the doctor and have the doctor do an EKG on them or ECG, whatever term they use. Same, same thing. We're asking all the attendees to please put your questions in the Q&A so we can answer them. Ms. Stephen. Thank you. I want to ask, what is a silent heart attack? I've heard that term, not too sure what it means. Can you explain that? The person have had a, a, a heart attack, but it wasn't severe enough for them to notice that they really did have a heart attack or they may have had some symptoms that they just, ah, you know, oh, I have a little chest pain and then it just went away and they maybe say, oh, okay, it's nothing. So until, if, so if, if they have an EKG, it will probably show that they had some, some, some damage to the heart, or if they have what they call an echocardiogram, they can look and see, you know, the, the, the condition of the heart. And there's a lot of people who've had those silent heart attacks and they leave me know. And that's again, why they call high blood pressure one of those, the, the silent killer, because you never know that it's doing this stuff to you. Okay, I have another one. Can sleep apnea 
lead to hypertension and even death? Sleep apnea. That means you're not getting you're not getting the um, you're not getting the oxygen that you need because you're stopping breathing. That's what sleep apnea means. You're not breathing. So yes, you can you can you can have a problem with the breathing, and you can yes, it can lead to death. What was the other part of that question? Um, okay. I asked if it could lead to hypertension as well. The, the hypertension, the hypertension, the hypertension is probably what caused the sleep apnea. Ah, okay. So if you have an issue with snoring loudly, um, and if, if what, go ahead. Yeah, if you have a problem with sleeping, um, um, snoring loudly, and sometimes you are told that you actually seem to stop breathing, that's a cause for concern? Yes, it is. Because actually sleep apnea leads to if you if you if you suffer with sleep apnea, you are more likely to have a stroke because you're not getting your breathing. And then there, there's a device that they use. It's called a, C, a CPAP machine, which means it's giving positive pressure, so it keeps the airway open. Because when you have sleep apnea, your 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 tongue is falling back in your throat. That's when you're snoring. It's falling back in your throat. It's blocking your air passages, so you aren't getting any any oxygen in. There's another okay. question. There's another yes. question. What can someone do to assist a loved one at home who may be suspected of having a heart attack before professional help arrives or he or she is taken to the hospital? What can you do if you suspect the person is having a heart attack? You try to keep them calm. You don't want to get them too excited. You need to observe what's going on with them as well. You know. Are they breathing okay? Because if 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 th there are three things that you need to be looking at, there's circulation. Do they have a pulse? You need to make sure that they're having a a, a regular pulse. Airway. Make sure that they're breathing. And if 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 they if they they're having an issue, then you probably need to um. If they, if they faint, then you probably need to con use full-blown CPR. There, there's, not, there's not much you can do there, except to really probably keep the person calm. Because you don't want them, you don't want them overexerting themselves. You don't want them doing things like that. Anyway, I'll move on so we can cover coronavirus. So I'll, I'll come back again at the end with questions. So the coronavirus viruses, they are a large family of viruses that cause respiratory illness in both humans and animals. There are three major types of coronaviruses from the coronaviridae virus family. Two of them cause severe acute respiratory disease syndrome. One of them is called SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. The other, the third one is called the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, causes the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome because it was in the Middle East is when, where it broke out, it never moved to the other part of the world. But the SARS-CoV-2 caused the worldwide pand pandemic called COVID-19 and it's called COVID-19 because 2019 is when it was started in, the, in Wuhan in China. So this family of viruses have a single-stranded positive sense RNA genome. So that is the, that is the, the genetic composition. The capsid, that is where the gene, this, this outer thing is called the capsid, is with the area that stores the, the genetic information. And the viruses have an envelope. So this here, I find this look like the, a little slink. So that is where all of the, the genetic in, um, information for the virus is located. And then they, they have a series of something called glycoproteins. It, it, these are like little envelopes 
and they stick out like spikes and that's why they call it a coronavirus because it looks like the spikes in a prong of the of a royal person or something So the glycoprotein, these little spikes here are what the cells, the, the viruses use to infect the whole cell. The COVID-19 vaccines are designed to stop the virus from entering and infecting cells of the body. So the, the COVID-19 virus, I mean, it's a vaccine. It, help, it, it, it disables these spikes from being able to go into the, the, the human cells. One, so how how do they how do the how does the virus get into the human body? The human body has some receptors called ACE2 receptors or angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors. A big name to say ACE2 receptors. These receptors are found on the lining of the cells of the blood vessels, the heart, the lungs, the the kidneys. And so what these the COVID-19 virus does. It looks for the ACE2 receptors. It locks that glycoprotein spike into that thing and it opens it like a key. And that is what allow, allows it to get into the cell and infect the cell. When it gets in there, it hijacks the cell and does what it wants to do and causes a problem. It destroys the body cells. So, the, like I said, the ACE2 receptors are found in the cells of the heart, brain, kidneys, the liver, the gastrointestinal tract and lining of the blood vessels. So if it's in the, in the blood vessels, it can cause clots. If it's in the lungs and hearts, it can cause problems with the, the pumping of the blood vessel of the blood and the heart. It can cause problems in the lungs. And I want you to think back about that. diagram that I had earlier about the lung cells with the pulmonary edema. So when you have COVID-19 and it attacks your, your blood cells, the, the angiotensin, the ACE, ACE2 in, um, receptors, they are, also required in, they are also necessary for controlling blood pressure and it's also necessary for controlling inflammatory responses. So once these things come up and you have all this inflammation in the lungs, the lungs fill up with, with fluid and there, there's no air exchange. And that's why these people die from not being able to breathe. You're essentially drowning in your fluids, in your fluids in your lungs. So the, one of the best things that you can actually do with this COVID-19 is to get that vaccine because that vaccine attacks or prevents these glycoproteins at, around in the spikes of the COVID-19 um, virus. It prevents them from being able to latch on to these ACE2 receptors. And what you want to note is that people who have high blood pressure, who have kidney disease, um, diabetes, they tend to have more of these ACE2 receptors. And so it has more places for this virus to attach and cause havoc in the, in the person's body and probably even cause them death. So that's it, that's um, concluding here. If there's any last minute questions, I will answer them. We're asking all attendees, all participants, please type in your questions so we can have them answered. There's one question from a participant. If someone has recovered from COVID-19, is it possible that the damage to vital organs may be irreparable? As of right now, the, the long-term effects of COVID-19 are still unknown, they're still being studied. So yes, some people, after they recover from the COVID-19 virus, they still have problems with their hearts, they still have problems with their vision, they still have, they have problems, they still have problems. So it, it, it's not like you get the cold, you get better and you feel much better. They still have lingering problems from this COVID-19 virus. And part of it is that they still, the, the effects of this virus are still being studied. So again, I said the best thing for you to do is to get the vaccine. Even if you do get the disease, it's not going to be as severe as if you did not have the vaccine. Another participant asks, what causes the lingering after COVID cough? And what would you recommend for it? 
I, the, the, the lingering cough probably has to do with damage to the lungs, but I'm, I'm not sure that, that you can do something about it. You probably want to go back and check with your doctors to make sure that they, they're treating you, they're, they're giving you the proper treatment for that cough. Because it may be that you cannot do anything about it, but it's part of the after effects of the COVID. Participants, please type in your questions. I want to ask one, um, if someone is known to be, well, is being treated for heart disease or heart issues, so there's some, they've been to the doctor and they're being treated, Mm -hmm. and you are a family member and they seem to be having a cardiac event at home. I know there's this tablet that some people have that they put under their tongue. Is mm -hmm. that recommend, you know, how, how do you know if or when you should do something like that? You're talking about the nitroglycerin tablets. Generally, it depends on most people who have those tablets are people who suffer with angina. So it depends on what it depends on what's wrong with you is, is the medication. So I, I, unless I was previously told by the doctor to give the person X, Y, Z, and generally if people have nitroglycerin tablets, they know what they're supposed to do if they're having a problem. But it may not be, it may not work for everybody. It may, you know, so It, you just need you just need to like I said follow the doctor's orders make sure that you take the medication as prescribed and do what you need to do to keep yourself healthy but again every medication is not to treat every every disorder of the heart or the, the lungs because because I use it or the doctor said told me to use it my my issue might be different from the other person so don't share your medications with people. Um, a participant has asked, if you have a sinus problem, is that a concern for COVID-19? What, what you're thinking about the sinus problem, it might, it might be a symptom of COVID-19. It might be just a cold. It might be just an upper respiratory um, infection that doesn't involve COVID-19. So I'm not sure if you have the COVID tests available, the, the home kit test kits available, you might want to use one of those if you have them available. Other than that, you probably go to your doctor or talk to them and find out about it. But sinus infections, they can be from a variety of reasons, for, be a, for a variety of reasons. And, and the signs and symptoms of COVID sometimes do mimic, do mimic sinus infections. But for the most part, the COVID, the COVID um, virus tends to go down deeper in the lungs where they can get onto those ACE2 receptors. Any other questions? If not, I will say thank you so much for your time today. And I hope I was able to answer some of your questions. And you have a better idea now of high blood pressure, that you need to control it. Stroke, you need to be careful. And again, keep your stress levels down. Heart failure is a result of high blood pressure and other situations that cause the, the fluid to back up in the lungs and to the rest of the body. And the heart can no longer pump against all of that pressure. But I hope some of these things brought some light to you today and that you can now go out there a little bit more empowered. Maybe you want to start a little exercise group with your friends and your family members. Maybe go walking, go swimming, go dancing, start a new exercise class. I don't know, something that will help you keep yourself mobile and empowered to do what is the right thing and lightening up some of the foods because our foods, I tell you, are full of a lot of those fats. So you might want to make a macaroni pie. Maybe you don't want to use full cream milk. Maybe you want to use maybe 2% milk or 1% milk, whatever, whatever it is, but you can lighten up some of the foods so that you can still enjoy them and make it heart healthy. 
again, thank you for your time. All right, I just would like to say on behalf of the Education Committee of the Public Services Credit Union, we'd like to thank Beverly Bile Hercules for her excellent presentation. And I'd like to encourage members to provide feedback with respect to the presentation and maybe some other areas that you may want us to focus on. And we could probably have Ms. Bayam Hercules come on another occasion and talk about different lifestyle diseases that may be of concern to you. So now I'll hand you back over to our moderator, Anika. Thank you so much, Ms. Stephen, Mrs. Stephen. And I want to wish every participant a happy Saturday and an enjoyable rest of your weekend. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.